any second now, Diggory is going to go off my lap and go into the garden and mow my lawn. All right, Diggs? And then I'm going to read the next excerpt of The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane by Kate DiCamillo. Hi, everybody. So Edward Tulane, to remind you, um, a china rabbit made of the same stuff as your dinner plates are made of sometimes, um, is at the dinner table. Um, his owner is um, 11 years old and his, her parents have just announced that they're going to take a ship to London and they're talking about whether Edward can go with and um, his Edward's eyes have just met the grandma's eyes and the grandma was the one who bought Edward for the little girl and um, her name is Pellegrina. She was looking at him in the way a hawk hanging lazily in the air might study a mouse on the ground. Perhaps the rabbit fur on Edward's ears and tails, tail and the whiskers on his nose had some dim memory of being hunted for a shiver went through him. Yes, said Pellegrina without taking her eyes off Edward. Who would watch over Abilene if the rabbit were not there? That night when Abilene asked, as she did every night, if there would be a story, Pellegrina said, Tonight, lady, there will be a story. Abilene sat up in bed. I think that Edward needs to sit here with me, she said, so that he can hear the story too. I think that is best, said Pellegrina. Yes, I think that the rabbit must hear the story. Abilene picked Edward up. <clears throat> sat him next to her in bed and arranged the covers around him. Then she said to Pellegrina, We are ready now. So, said Pellegrina, she coughed. And so, the story begins with a princess. A beautiful princess? Abilene asked. A very beautiful princess. How beautiful? You must listen, said Pellegrina. It's all in the story. Chapter 4 that's a picture of, I think, Edward in bed. We'll see. I mean, uh, yeah. OK. Once there was a princess who was very beautiful. She shone as bright as the stars on a moonless night. But what difference did it make that she was beautiful? None. No difference. Why did it make no difference? asked Abilene. Because, said Pellegrina, she was a princess who loved no one and cared nothing for love, even though there were many who loved her. At this point in her story, Pellegrina stopped and looked right at Edward. She stared deep into his painted eyes and again Edward felt a shiver go through him. There's a picture of Edward and of um, Abilene and Pellegrina. Pellegrina telling the story. <clears throat> and so, said Pellegrina, still staring at Edward, what happened to the princess? Said Abilene. And so, said Pellegrina, turning back to Abilene, the king, her father, said that the princess must marry and soon after this a prince came from a neighbouring kingdom and he saw the princess and immediately he loved her. He gave her a ring of pure gold. He placed it on her finger. He said these words to her, I love you. But do you know what the princess did? Abilene shook her head. She swallowed the ring. <clears throat> she took it from her finger and swallowed it. She said, that is what I think of love. And she ran from the prince. She left the castle and went deep into the woods. And so... And so what, said Abilene? What happened then? And so the princess became lost in the woods. She wandered for many days. Finally, she came to a little hut and she knocked on the door and she said, let me in, I'm cold. There was no answer. She knocked again. She said, let me in, I'm hungry. A terrible voice answered her. The voice said, enter if you must. The beautiful princess entered and she saw a witch sitting at a table counting pieces of gold. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-two, said the witch. I am lost, said the beautiful princess. What of it, said the witch. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-three. I am hungry, said the princess. Not my concern, said the witch. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-four. But I am a beautiful princess, said the princess. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-five, replied the witch. My father, said the princess, is a powerful king. You must help me or there will be consequences. 
Consequences, said the witch. She looked up from her gold. She stared at the princess. You dare talk to me of consequences? Very well, then. We will speak of consequences. Tell me the name of the one you love. Love, said the princess. She stamped her foot. Why must everyone speak of love? Whom do you love, said the witch. You must tell me the name. I love no one, said the princess proudly. You disappoint me, said the witch. She raised her hand and said one word. Fast figury. And the beautiful princess was changed into a warthog. What have you done to me? squealed the princess. Talk to me of consequences now, will you? said the witch. And she went back to counting her pieces of gold. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-six, said the witch, as the warthog princess ran from the hut and out again into the forest. The king's men were in the forest too. And what were they looking for? a beautiful princess and so when they came upon an ugly warthog they shot it immediately pow <clears throat> no said abeline yes said pellegrina the men took the warthog back to the castle and the cook slit open its belly and inside it found a ring of pure gold <clears throat> There were many hungry people in the castle that night and all of them were waiting to be fed. So the cook put the ring on her finger and finished butchering the warthog. And the ring that the beautiful princess had swallowed shone on the cook's hand as she did her work. The end. The end? said Abilene indignantly. Yes, said Pellegrina. The end. But it can't be. Why can't it be? Because it came too quickly. Because no one is living happily ever after. That's why... Ah, and so Pellegrina nodded. <clears throat> Sorry, I've lost my place. Um, <laughs> let's have a look. Um, let's have a look. And so Pellegrina nodded. Um, she was quiet for a moment, but answer me this. How can a story end happily if there is no love? <clears throat> but, well, it is late and you must go to sleep. Pellegrina took Edward from Abilene. She put him in his bed and pulled the sheet up to his whiskers. She leaned close to him. She whispered, you disappoint me. After the old lady left, Edward lay in his small bed and stared up at the ceiling. The story, he thought, had been pointless. But then most stories were. He thought of the princess and how she had become a warthog and how gruesome, how grotesque. What a terrible fate. Edward, said Abilene, I love you. I don't care how old I get. I will always love you. Yes, yes, thought Edward. He continued to stare up at the ceiling. He was agitated for some reason that he could not name. He wished that Pellegrina had put him on the, on the side so that he might look at the stars. And then he remembered Pellegrina's description of the beautiful princess. She shone as bright as the stars on a moonless night. For some reason, Edward found comfort in these words, and he repeated them to himself. As bright as the stars on a moonless night. As bright as the stars on a moonless night. Over and over he said them, until at last the first light of dawn appeared. Chapter 5 the house on Egypt Street became frantic with activity as the Tulane family prepared for their voyage to England. Edward possessed a small trunk and Abilene packed it for him, filling it with his finest suits and several of his best hats and three pairs of shoes, all so that he might cut a fine figure in London. Before she placed each outfit in the trunk, she displayed it to him. Do you like this shirt with this suit? she asked him. Or would you like to wear your black derby? You look very handsome in it. Shall we pack it? And then finally, on a bright Sunday morning in May, Edward and Abilene and Mr and Mrs Tulane were all on board the ship standing at the railing. Pellegrina was at the dock. On her head she wore a floppy hat strung around with flowers. She stared straight at Edward. Her dark eyes glowed. Goodbye, Abilene shouted to her grandmother. I love you. The ship pulled away from the dock. Pellegrina waved to Abilene. Goodbye, lady, she called. Goodbye. <clears throat> Edward felt something damp in his ears. Abilene's tears, he supposed. He wished she would not hold him so tight. To be clutched so fiercely often resulted in wrinkled clothing. Finally, all the people on land, including Pellegrina, disappeared. Edward, for one, was relieved to see the last of her. As was to be expected, Edward Chilane exacted much attention on board the ship. 
What a singular rabbit, said an elderly lady with three strings of pearls wrapped around her neck. She bent down to look more closely at Edward. Thank you, said Abilene. Several little girls on board gave, gave Edward deep glances full of longing. They asked Abilene if they might hold him. No, said Abilene. I'm afraid that he's not the kind of rabbit who likes to be held by strangers. Two young boys, brothers named Martin and Amos, took a particular interest in Edward. What does he do? Martin asked Abilene on their second day at sea. He pointed at Edward, who was sitting on a deck chair with his long legs stretched in front of him. He doesn't do anything, said Abilene. Does he wind up somewhere? asked Am Amos. No, said Abilene, he does not wind up. What's the point of him then? said Martin. The point is that he is Edward, said Abilene. That's not much of a point, said Amos. It's not, agreed Martin. And then, after a long, thoughtful pause, he said, I wouldn't let anybody dress me like that. Me neither, said Amos. Do his clothes come off? asked Martin. Of course they do, said Abilene. He has many different outfits and he has his own pyjamas too. They are made of silk. Edward, as usual, was disregarding the conversation. A breeze was blowing in off the sea and the silk scarf wrapped around his neck billowed out behind him. On his head he wore a straw boater, which is a kind of hat. The rabbit was thinking that he must look quite dashing. It came as a total surprise to him when he was grabbed off the deck chair and first his scarf and then his jacket and pants were ripped from his body. He heard his pocket watch hit the deck of the ship and then, held upside down, he watched the watch roll merrily towards... Abilene's feet. Look at him, said Martin. He's even got underwear. He held Edward aloft so that Amos could see. Take it off, shouted Amos. No, screamed Abilene. Martin removed Edward's underwear. Edward was paying attention now. He was mortified, which means he really wasn't very happy. He was completely naked, except for the hat on his head. And the other passengers... Oh dear, I've gone forward a few pages. Uh, where am I? Uh, I've gone backward a few pages. Hang on, guys. He was completely... Yeah, the ship pulled away. Does he wind up? Yes, he was completely mortified. Okay. Give him to me, screamed Abilene. He's mine! He's very embarrassed, by the way. Yes, he's very embarrassed. No, said Amos to Martin. Give him to me. He clapped his hands together and then held them open. Toss him, he said. Please, cried Abilene, don't throw him. He's made of china. He'll break. Martin threw Edward. And Edward sailed naked through the air. Only a moment ago, the rabbit had thought that being naked in front of a shipload of strangers was the worst thing that could happen to him. But he was wrong. It was much worse being tossed in the same naked state from the hands of one grubby laughing boy to another. Amos caught Edward and held him up, displaying him triumphantly. Throw him back, called Martin. Amos raised his arm. But just as he was getting ready to throw Edward, Abilene tackled him, shoving her head into his stomach and upsetting the boy's aim. So it was that Edward did not go flying back into the dirty hands of Martin. Instead, Edward Tulane went overboard.